The War and Culture Studies Archive Collection came to the University of Bristol in early 2020. Um, before that, it was actually based in the University of Westminster. This is where the Group for War and Culture Studies was established in 1995. And this was a, a, a group that changed the way that we thought about war and the experience of war from one that had focused predominantly on the military experience or the diplomatic experience of war to one that actually started to examine the cultural artefacts of war, the, the experiences of war and the, 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 the things that war left behind. So, for example, literature, film, poetry, so on and so forth. Um, and what the group did was it organised an annual conference and it rapidly became apparent that this conference and the subject itself was of interest not only to academics but to a much broader public. So news of the existence of the group spread and uh, donations followed and these donations usually took the form, because the group was based in the Department of French at the University of Westminster, of material donated by uh, French residents of London or the descendants of those residents, uh, French, French residents who had uh, lived in London during the Second World War. The archive holds material mainly concerned with the French experience of the Second World War and we have just under 600 items. I think one of the highlights of the archive is the collection of La France Libre. So this was a, a monthly review that was published by the French government in exile, Les Forces de la France Libre, and it therefore provides a, a, a sort of a history of their experience of the war. So there are obviously some propagandistic elements within this uh, material, um, which of course is, is not without interest in its own right. Um, La France Libre is a very diverse review though, so it usually contains in each issue um, a summary, a sort of état présent, as they say in French, of the war and its conduct. And this is usually written by uh, a leading general within the Free French Forces. Um, but it's more than just a, a sort of a, a military or a diplomatic history. So, for example, there's a sort of soft diplomacy. We have a series of articles written usually by English language uh, intellectuals. So people like T.S. Eliot, for example, and the series is called um, What France Means to You. And these are usually short essays about the importance of French culture, of French society, um, and um, therefore they, they form part of a kind of a, a diplomatic front, if you like, a cultural diplomatic front of the war effort. La France Libre also um, contains um, a number of essays which um, consider the future of France and the future shape of, of, of Europe after it's been liberated. Um, one of the really interesting things we find in it, though, for me, is, that, is the, the advertisements. So these are full of advertisements by British companies. Um, during the course of the war, obviously, we find advertisements for things like restaurants and particularly French restaurants in, in London, particularly in Soho. Um, but we also see traditional, traditional British products and companies being marketed to the French in exile. So one of, uh, one of my favourites is, is the advert for HP Source, for example, um, which looks forward to a time when we can regularly see HP Source on our tables again. There's another one uh, arguing why the French should read the Yorkshire Post, for example, which suggests that we have lots of French-speaking communities throughout um, Britain and not just located in London at this time. Um, and then as the war progresses and as the liberation of Europe, and the liberation of France in particular approaches, we see British companies positioning themselves to, uh, to be able to, to help with the reconstruction of France. So we see this in a range of advertisements, for example, in really obvious things like iron and steel manufacture, uh, the aviation industry, but also in, in plans by um, WH Smith, for example, to set up a branch in Paris. And the really interesting thing, I think, is that these advertisements are in French and it really suggests an effort by British business to speak to the French in their own language rather than to, to make assumptions about their ability to speak English. The collection also contains uh, an important uh, number of literary works. 
So, for example, we have a number of, of poetry anthologies. Um, these are sometimes um, published by French uh, language publishers in Switzerland, but also in London. Um, we have um, a couple of examples of the, the Cahiers du Rhône, which was a publication of poetry published in Switzerland during the course of the war. Um, we have collections um, which were published shortly after the liberation of France, which often feature, which are often include poems that were published in captivity. So this would either be by prisoners of war or by those who consider the occupation a form of captivity. Um, one of the really interesting collections, elements of the collection, is the, the, the Edition de Minuit first editions. So the Edition de Minuit were a clandestine publisher um, that published throughout France during the occupation. Um, and the uh, first editions that we have uh, were all published in uh, Paris in late 1944, which suggests that many of these were probably using the printing presses on which the clandestine versions of these um, stories, essays and poems were originally produced. So we have the obvious classics like Vercors, Le Silence de la Mer, but also a number of works by other resistance writers who used the names of regions associated with um, resistance activity. So, for example, Seven and Argonne. And finally, I think the other really interesting element is that the number of essays we have by French intellectuals. So some of these are published by French intellectuals in exile uh, in New York, for example, Mexico City and obviously London. Um, and some of them are actually memoirs published very shortly after the war, which record the experiences of occupation by writers like, for example, uh, Georges Duhamel. All of these essays are, are interesting because they, they don't just record personal experiences, but they are reflections upon the future state of France, the future state of Europe. And we find in them, uh, just as we do in La France Libre, the idea of, of a sort of European Union um, that will emerge from the, uh, the liberation of Europe, um, which is taking place as many of these essays are actually being written. So they're speculative works and they're, they're interesting um, because they're not so much reflections on the current state of affairs, but on a future state of affairs. I think this is an important collection because it captures that journey of the, the French in exile from defeat to liberation to the construction of a new government. Um, it also uh, shows us how people were beginning to imagine peace even at a time of war, how they were beginning to reimagine France, how they were beginning to reimagine Europe. I think though for me it's mostly interesting because it's a very touching testimony to an enduring friendship between France and Britain that um, was cemented by the war experience. It was just cemented by the experience of government in exile, life in exile in the UK during the war years. It's therefore a collection which is going to be of interest to uh, cultural historians, military historians, historians of, of diplomatic relations. I think it's uh, going to be of interest to those with an interest in the cultural and intellectual history of France, but also with those with an interest in the cultural and intellectual history of Britain at this time. So I would say that it's therefore uh, a collection um, which is going to appeal to a wide range of academics. I also think, though, it's a collection which um, many of us could take an interest in. Um, I think, the, for example, the, the advertisements in La France Libre uh, cast a light on Britain at this time, which I think is going to be of, of, of general interest to, um, to people living in Bristol, um, but also more widely in the UK.